right, let's do it. We're back in the sports barn after a little bit of a weekend hiatus. It's Eric the Big E Arnold. It is Monday, February 1st here in eastern Pennsylvania. We're in the midst of a huge snowstorm uh, as I look out the window. Weird deal here. It like snowed, oh, I don't know, it looks like about eight inches out there. Stopped. Now it's supposed to snow another eight inches, maybe more. Weird. Anyway, I guess uh, New York City is going to get even more than we are. <laughs> I've been in New York City when they've had huge blizzards. And uh, it, 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 it's tough. The whole city locks down. What do you do with the snow? You know, it, it just paralyzes the whole city. You got nowhere to go with the snow. Ultimately, back in the day, they would just uh, load it up in dump trucks and dump it in the river. Uh, I don't know what they do now. That's probably not environmentally friendly somehow, and they probably don't do that anymore. I don't know what they do. Anyway, it doesn't matter. We have, uh, what, five games for you here on Monday. Uh, I don't know if we have much of a recap for you. It's been so long since we made any picks. Uh, last time we picked, I think we had three winners, two losers. That was Thursday night, I guess. I've updated the scoreboard, so it's now accurate. Uh, well, we, we, we don't lie to you. <laughs> we show you our crummy record. Uh, we're 500 in the NFL, 500 in college basketball. You do better flipping a coin than watching this channel. Uh, but, you know, um, we're hoping to do better. You know, I know, I, I, I know, I think, I think we can do better. I honestly believe that there are better days ahead. I think our record will improve when the fans get back in the stands and the games somewhat get back into their historical norms uh, as far as travel, as far as uh, practice, as far as everybody's going to play and you don't lose your best player an hour before tip off, you know, shit like that, that we've all, you've all accepted it more than I have. I've realized that, that I'm an outlier, you know, I'm, I'm ready to, you know, ready to jump off a bridge and everybody's like, I don't mind wearing the mask. It's like, well, that's good because they're going to make you wear two of them now. So, you should really like that. If you don't mind wearing one, you should exceptionally enjoy wearing two. Uh, anyway, I want to comment on uh, the Wall Street turmoil, which frankly has been taking up some of my time. That's partially why you haven't gotten uh, any other videos here lately. Uh, I think it's something to pay attention to. You know, you're probably thinking, well, how in the hell could one little stock called GameStop, you know, affect me. I don't have GameStop stock. I would never have something like that. That's way too volatile. And I'm a conservative, uh, responsible person. I wouldn't be involved in that. Why does this affect me? Well, here, here's, and look, I don't know a dick about the stock market. I know less about the stock market than I do about handicapped and sports, so I don't know anything. Uh, However, you know, I know enough to be dangerous, so I guess my take on the deal is that um, what's happening is you've got a bunch of Wall Street rich guys, typically called hedge funds, they have bet against GameStop, uh, among other stocks, I guess AMC, that's another one. Uh, you know, these are typically not very good companies. Uh, they're not making money. Uh, some of it through their own fault, some of it through no fault of their own because of the pandemic. Uh, they're heavily indebted. So if you want to bet against a company, you can do that in Wall Street, which is called short selling a stock. Uh, I would argue it's somewhat of a controversial practice that's been allowed forever. So maybe it's not controversial. I said controversial because a lot of people say that shouldn't be illegal. You should not be allowed to do that. But, you know, this is Wall Street. I mean, 
If you think going into uh, uh, the casino up at Penn National is a casino, go go on Wall Street. I mean, as a guy with money in his pocket, you know, it's not such a casino that you and I, you know, how much money you have to bet? Well, I've got $100,000. They laugh at you. But if you go up there with $100 million, you can do anything. You can make up your own bets. It, it's... Watch the movie Big Short uh, with Christian Bale, uh, Steve Carell. If you haven't seen that movie, you need to watch that movie. Very important. They teach you things in that movie that they don't teach you in school. So you need to watch that movie. Big Short. Uh, so anyway, where was a short selling stock? Um, one of the most controversial practices on Wall Street, which is illegal, but no one enforces it, is called naked short selling. That means basically you are betting shares uh, against a stock that you don't have, that you don't own, that you're never going to own. Uh, what ultimately ends up happening is a bunch of rich guys get together and want to short a stock. Um, they can create a shark attack through all the selling to crash the price of the stock. And it's done sometimes through artificial illegal means where they're selling shares that don't actually exist. It's totally illegal and no one enforces it. And because the hedge funds and rich guys control all the books, it's hard to tell it happens. You know it's going on, but it's hard to prove because you know the people that are getting it in the shorts, which are generally the retail investor, i.e. poor people, they don't have access to the books. So, you know, it's kind of like, well, never mind. But, so that's what's going on here with this GameStop is you have the rich guys you know, they're betting that the stock is going to go down. And they're way heavy invested in this, more than they should be. They're way indebted, way leveraged. You know, so they can, that's another way where you can create this shark effect is I only have, say, 10 shares to bet against that stock. But if I borrow more and borrow more with, I can get 10, 20, 30, 100. You know, and now I can really create this wave of selling and drive this thing down. The thing goes down, I make money. Uh, the people that are betting that the stock is a good stock, it's a good company, they lose money. So uh, there's a lot of debt here pushing this stock down. That's what the rich guys wanted to do. But what's happened now is a lot of, some of this information is public as far as who the rich guys are betting against. Uh, so uh, a number of 30-something uh, year old traders have created themselves a website. I think it's called Wall Street Bets. Uh, I think they also hang out at a Reddit chat room where they attract other Millennials with stimulus checks and or other little money where they have. So these guys all now have decided, well, if we just bet against one of these companies, that all these guys are betting that's going to go down. What if we all show up at once and buy it at once, all at once? Well, that's what's happened. So you have all these millennials showing up with what? A couple thousand here, a couple thousand there, times a million. Boom! These guys have forced the price of this to go screaming higher. And when you short a stock, your losses on the upside are unlimited. Uh, without making this video 30 minutes long, uh, suffice it to say that uh, you're liable for that borrowed share. And the higher it goes, the worse your losses are until you call uncle and say, I quit, I'm out. I need to buy that share back and get out of this trade, get out of this position. I give up. 
So this stock is now, you know, what's normally a $10 to $20 stock. Uh, it opened this morning up above 300 I think it's come down a little bit since then. But, you know, th there you go. It's up 10 times what it normally should be. And these hedge funds are not losing millions of dollars. They're losing tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars. Not only that, and this is how it affects you, is... The hedge funds are in financial trouble. I mean, just this one trade in this one position, this small little insignificant company is threatening to put some of these hedge funds out of business. Stuff like that causes a cascade effect. Um, when you trade your stock, you do it through a broker, no doubt. Some kind of middleman. Uh, PD Ameritrade, E-Trade, um, gosh, some of them have all merged together. Charles Schwab, now Schwab and Ameritrade are all the same thing. Well, let's just say for foreign uh, 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 E-Trade. Um, so uh, Robin Hood, that's the one all these millennials are using for whatever reason. Uh, I guess it's because it's an app on their phone and that's all they know how to do is do stuff on their phone. So Robin Hood is one of these middlemen that allows these millennials to bet, to invest, to buy or sell stock. Well, Robin Hood's on the hook now in some fashion. You're saying, well, what, well how's that possible? Uh, all they should be doing is booking the bets. All they should be doing is just going on the open market and buying and selling this GME. I, I, I agree, and I don't have the answer to that one. I'm not 100% sure, but I know this for a fact. I know this, I think this is true. I don't know it for a fact. <laughs> Robin Hood's in trouble. I mean, they're, they're issuing all kind of guidance. They're coming out saying, wait, 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 stop. You guys can't buy any more of that stock. You gotta stop. And, and everybody's outraged because they're screwing these millennials that wanna drive the price higher. Uh, they've been limited by Robin Hood as to how much they can buy and everyone's outraged what they what the Millennials believe and I think they're incorrect is the Millennials believe that the rich guys and Robin Hood are working together in other words rich guys have gotten with Robin Hood after hours and said we're gonna be out of business in a week if this keeps up you gotta save us you got to stop these guys from buying this stock. Give us a few days to let the price stabilize and come back down to respectable numbers where we can get the hell out of these trades and not go bankrupt. Maybe. Maybe that I'm not 100%. I, I don't think that's happened. I don't think that's happened, but it may have. It may have. What I think it's happened is somehow Robin Hood is partially liable for these huge gains that these traders have uh, accumulated. That somehow Robin Hood's on the other side of these trades with the hedge funds. Now they shouldn't be, I don't think, from what little I understand about Wall Street. But I believe they have what they call a liquidity problem. In other words, they don't have enough money. You know, when all these guys, all these millennials, they come to cash out and take their winnings, Robin Hood's not going to have it. They're not going to have it. That's what, back in the day, they used to call a run on the bank. When, uh, if you've ever seen, uh, uh, oh, it's the Christmas movie. I've actually never seen it. With Jimmy Stewart, uh, it's a wonderful life. Uh, and part of that story, I believe, revolves around the run on the bank, where Jimmy Stewart, I think, owns or runs a bank, and uh, he has to try to survive because he doesn't have enough money in the bank. And what if everybody comes and wants their money out of the bank all at once? He's going to, not only is he going to go under, but he's going to take all of the townspeople with him because they've got their savings with him. Uh, and I'm making this up because I've never seen the movie. Uh, but I'm pretty sure I'm close on that. At any rate, a run of bank is a disaster because it causes a cascading virus effect 
where now everybody loses confidence in the system and it's a hit, everybody's running for the door and look out, then it's, it's a panic. Uh, so that's where I think this is uh, something to keep an eye on. You know, if it turns out that Robin Hood cannot pay off their bets, uh, or uh, these hedge funds go under, uh, yeah, that, that's a contagion that could spill over possibly. And I didn't totally make this up either. Uh, I read this on Zero Hedge. Uh, if you like uh, financial fear porn, that's where you go. Zero Hedge. They always have lots of articles about the end of the world financially. Or with the virus, just the end of the world, period. Uh, so, Zero Hedge uh, posted that Goldman Sachs, one of the biggest American uh, uh, Wall Street investment firms there is, uh, they issued a, a warning to all their clients saying, hey, if this shit continues, you know, that could cause a market crash. You know, it's like, well, I, you know, it's, it's, I, I came to that conclusion too, so I'm not totally all by myself in this. Uh, so, yeah, something to keep an eye on. Uh, right now, apparently, these pajama boys, these uh, millennial traders, I guess the next thing they've decided, this is, I, I guess there's controversy in this. Somebody's pushing silver. Now, it depends on who you listen to, who's pushing it. You know, one side says, yeah, it's the Reddit crew, it's the Pajama Boys, it's the Retards, it's the Austis, it's whatever the hell these guys' kids call themselves. Uh, and then another side says, no, 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 they're committed to the GME fight, and this is a smokescreen, and it's actually the hedge funds. The hedge funds are pushing silver. So, you know, if you're rooting for one side or the other, um, I guess I don't know who's shoving the silver. I know who's showing this, uh, the uh, pajama crew, they out and out admit and uh, are excited to tell you that they're the ones doing it. Uh, so uh, I don't know how it all ends. I, uh, you know, uh, uh, I, don't, I think the most likely scenario it ends with if you're not involved in GME, nothing happens. <laughs> For you and me, probably nothing. Uh, but there's a small chance that, you know, this could cause some kind of spillover effect. And that's what I've been watching. I've been paying attention to that. Uh, to make sure, you know, you got to always be, limit your liabilities. Be protected on the downside. So, all right. That's a little stock market. What, what's that have to do with gambling? That has everything to do with gambling. Because that's all investing is anymore in this country. God, the days of safe investments where I could stick my money in the bank and earn 6%. Oh, that, that went out the window with, uh, you know, with <laughs> well, it went out the window with smoking, where you're allowed to smoke. Uh, went out the window with uh, uh, unleaded gasoline. I don't have that anymore. So, no, you can't invest your money responsibly. You have to play the game. You gotta play the casino. You always got a guard in the casino for, you know, I'm changing the rules or the roof caving in. So that's how you got to do it when you got any, you've accumulated any kind of holdings in this country. If you've worked for 30 years and saved anything, always got to be on the uh, defense. Talk about defensive driving. This is defensive investing. Got to always watch. Always be aware. All right, let's talk basketball. Oh, we got uh, some slate here. If I get this video done in time, I can tell you about Georgia Tech. They play at 2 o'clock, I guess, in an empty arena in Louisville. Uh, I don't see that much difference between these two teams. Georgia Tech had two bad losses early in the season, and since then, they've basically been just as good as Louisville. So we're catching four and a half points in an empty arena. I don't see anything to do here but take Georgia Tech. You're getting value. And Louisville's not, if they're any better than Georgia Tech, it's a point. Maybe two. Uh, I just, I, 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 where's the home court advantage? It's an empty arena. I, I just, uh, 
you know, I, I haven't figured out the COVID yet. I don't know I ever will. I, I don't want to. Let's put it that way. I want this to be the hell over. And I don't want to spend a hell of a lot of time trying to figure out, you know, in other words, well, maybe I should uh, start doing some math and figuring out how this works all with the COVID and whatnot. You know, because it's going to be around for another three years. Shut the fuck up! I don't want to hear that. I want this to be over now. But, you know, so we refuse to uh, try to research the history of uh, how COVID affects the scores because I just don't want to waste the time. I'm pretending this is going to be over soon. Uh, but, anyway, I think Jordan Tech should play there. Uh, Bradley, Indiana State. These two just played over the weekend in, you know, at Indiana State. Some of these conferences, that's how they're scheduling it with these double headers, basically, I guess, to limit the travel um, as if, you know, that's going to, <laughs> as if that's going to do anything to any, you know, whatever. Uh, so... Indiana State won the opener at home over the weekend. Now they're coming back. Uh, Bradley, still a two-point favorite. Uh, I looked at the box score. It looked to me like Bradley got in foul trouble. Indiana State shot like 26 free throws. I think Bradley shot seven. Um, I, so I think that's an anomaly. I, now, you know, I did, if you want to play Indiana State, I did notice they missed half of their free throws. So had Indiana State made their free throws, they would have won that game by 10 points, as it was they won by, I think, you know, two or three. Uh, I just think the number of fouls and free throws was just off. For whatever reason... Uh, Bradley committed a lot more fouls and perhaps the officials aided them. If I'm that Bradley coach, I am all over this next set of officials. And I'm just reminding them, hey, John, good to see you, man. I tell you, that last crew that was in here, whoo, I don't want to speak ill of people that aren't here but and we're talking out of school. But let me tell you, you know, uh, he's a good coach. So I have a feeling he's going to have a way of getting his message across in perhaps not even that subtle a fashion. So uh, I think Bradley's going to get the benefit of some calls. I think they're the better team. Uh, they, they, they've, had, they've had a bad year. But uh, they've got 10 games to get going in a straight line so they can try to steal an NCAA bid in the Valley Tournament. So I think Bradley uh, is going to get the W here this afternoon with Indiana State later, too. All right, uh, late guy, or yeah, uh, what, evening games. Uh, 7 o'clock game, you got Duke, you got Miami. Uh, Duke, they're ranked 28th in the Ken Pomeroy. Um, I don't know. I, it, that seems overranked to me. Uh, they're 7 and 5. Uh, I guess basically Duke will make the tournament unless they. You know, well, unless they lose games like this. Uh, so I guess right there, that tells you where I'm going. You know, Krzyzewski's not going to miss the tournament. Uh, for one thing, I'm certain he, I'm making this up, but I'm certain he has a clause in his contract where he owes ESPN several million dollars if he has a losing record or fails to make the tournament. Uh, since he is, you know, most of their content, it seems like. So I don't think he wants to pay them. So he's going to hammer the hell out of Miami. Miami's short-handed. Uh, their best player's been hurt all year. They've got a couple other injuries. They've just been getting bombed every game here for the past three weeks, losing by double digits, double digits, double digits. And, and now you got Duke. I think Duke is starting to, you know, there's, whatever they do well, they're starting to figure out what that is. And, uh, you know, they're, they're starting to play better. This is, you know, this is a bad Duke team. But uh, a bad Duke team is still better than, you know, a lot of teams. 
uh, of Miami being one of them. So we'll take Duke, we'll lay the 11 and a half. All right, uh, back in the valley again. Loyola is 16. Where'd these guys come from? Um, they, they were, uh, I guess, uh, the, sec the second to most recent uh, year uh, in the tournament. You know, one last year, or, or well, the last year didn't happen, but the year before that, what was it? It was uh, the, oh, I've forgotten, but two years ago when that Virginia team won it all and they beat uh, Texas Tech, they were one of the teams in the Final Four. So now it looks like they're coming back and they've got another really good team. They are beating people double digits left and right, uh, really on a hot streak. They just trashed Missouri State uh, in Springfield over the weekend. Again, this is the second of a back-to-back. -back. So uh, they were up oh, 25, 30 points in the first half, just splat. <laughs> so... Is Missouri State now going to make a stand, uh, say, get all fired up? Did they go back to their dorm rooms and say, that's, that's terrible, we're going to play harder? I don't know. I, I think that when you're on a roll, you're on a roll. And right now, I don't know, I'd get in front of Loyola. So we'll lay the seven and a half on the road here with Loyola. Uh, I mean, think about that. If this is truly a Final Four team like it was two years ago, and you're only laying seven and a half against the Missouri State. You know, if that said Creighton, if that said Villanova, if that said Ohio State, if that said uh, 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 duh, Illinois, oh man, that number would be 11, 12 points. So uh, I think you might be getting a little value here depending on how good Loyola is. So we'll lay the points. And then late night, this is a shame because this is a fantastic game. You have Oklahoma, you have Texas Tech. Oklahoma has been hot. They've been hot. They've beaten Kansas. They've beaten Texas. Texas in the top 10 when they beat them. They just went on the road and beat Alabama, who is arguably the best team in the SEC. Texas Tech has been playing pretty well. Uh, they got, uh, they fell on the wrong side of the seesaw up at West Virginia last Monday, uh, losing by one point. But then they went down to LSU and beat them. So you got two really, really good teams here. Uh, why it's a shame is because Oklahoma, two of their best players, aren't going to play. And somehow they beat Alabama without those guys. So, you know, what is going on there? Who are these Oklahoma guys that can beat Alabama without their best players? We're going to kind of take an opposite view on this one now. We just, I think we have to. Um, for one thing, I don't have any home teams. So I've been trying to mix it up. I've been trying to, you know, as a... Some of you viewers have stopped through the bar and have said, wow, this is boring. The guy just always picks the road team. Uh, we don't have any home team, so we're going to take the home team here. I, I, I think the theory is sound. You know, they just played a tough, tough Alabama team on Saturday. And now they're going to come back and fl fly all the way from Alabama to Lubbock, Texas. You know, that's a pretty long trip. Um, they're probably only playing five, six guys, a five, six man rotation. They had, I don't know, at least three guys get upwards of 35 minutes or so uh, in that Alabama game. I just think they're going to be a little tired. Uh, and those guys that had such great games against Alabama, just not going to be there against Texas Tech. You know, I think that front rim is going to get pretty big and they're going to have a lot of shots hitting that front rim because you're tired. And we're going to say Texas Tech is going to get it done at home over the depleted Oklahoma Sooners. Uh, you know, it, it, no shame Oklahoma. I mean, beating Alabama with uh, one hand tied behind your back, that's impressive. 
Uh, and that's why it's a shame. I would love to see this game if both teams were playing with a full deck. But, hey, COVID, you know, COVID. Uh, it's just the new normal. We just have to live with it, right? So, there you have it. We got a, uh, oh, we'll show it to you here. We'll show it to you, our new production values. What's next? What's left? Uh, we're going to have a Super Bowl video. It may be tomorrow. Uh, maybe Wednesday. I haven't decided yet. Uh, I've got a, got a pretty good idea in mind to have what we're going to do to uh, pick the Super Bowl winner. Uh, and then, uh, well, after that, then we're just back to college basketball. I'll probably try to dig into some props for the, I know we had at least one request for props. And uh, I just don't know there are not many props involved with college basketball. They seem to be mostly centered about pro sports. Um, I, w I was, uh, someone was telling me about a prop uh, dealing with uh, whether a team will score a goal in the first 10 minutes in hockey. Well, yeah, that's kind of cool. So I'll have to, you know, I'll have to do better. I will, do, uh, I will get you some props, if nothing else, involving the Super Bowl. Uh, certainly the anthem, that's always a prop I look for. Uh, it's been getting harder and harder to win that one, though. Uh, the line is getting much sharper in recent years on the anthem. Uh, so here, let's show it to you. And you can see, there we got snow. Look at the pretty snow. Look at the pretty snow. The pretty snow that's a pain in the ass. All right, and then we have these five games today. We appreciate all you people that are stopping by. Like the loyalty. Hit the like button if this is content you enjoy. And we'll try to do better next time. From me to you, let's have some winners tonight. Signing off.